Part 3, 18 and 19 on the website. Sermon on the Mount, more perfectly. Matthew chapter 7, we're looking at verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and eventually 6 maybe. And he's talking about judging. We just, just kind of recap this morning in case, in case anybody pops in on part 3. Judge not that ye be not judged in verse 1 of Matthew 7. He's not even talking to the Jewish gang. He's talking to hypocrites within the Jews, which might be all the Jews, but uh, he's basically talking to somebody who's very quick to judge somebody else, but they've got their own problems. Because uh, uh, it, it can't be the fact that he's telling everybody not to judge or you'll be judged back. That's not what he's saying at all. Because he says in John and in Luke and in Matthew again in 7.15, he tells people to judge all the time, judge righteousness. Righteous judgment, judge right, uh, judge uh, rightly, he says, in different places. So even in, the, even in the gospel days, he told people to judge things, what's right or wrong. It's crazy that modern people today don't want, don't want to have anything to do with judgment, whether they receive it or even give it out. They're afraid to hurt people. Then we go to Romans chapter 2, where it talks about, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever Thou, that, uh, thou art that judge, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. And again, he's talking to a lost person there. We don't have to fear uh, God's judgment. And a person that doesn't understand the rightly divided Christ is not going to understand any of this judgment stuff. Because as far as a modern Christian who think you have to stop sinning, then you're under the uh, fear of being judged at all times. And that's not the case. So, do you, do you see how important it is to understand uh, Paul's stuff? Without going into the detailed arguments back and forth about judging, if you just understand what God did with salvation and sin, that the, the simple answer is the fact, well, we can't be judged because there's no sin there to judge us. And so that whole issue gets taken care of. Our works will be judged, we know that, so we won't get into that. Then we talked a little bit this morning about who was this Paul guy anyway, because he did things he wasn't supposed to do, and he did, didn't do things he should have done. And, and yet God was in that chose him and, and uh, made him into a new creature. Talked about a little, little bit about uh, probably the best verse to look at is in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, where he actually tells us we're to grow in judgment. So as we grow up as a Christian, instead of being a child, uh, know nothing about, as a child, know nothing about judgment, that also as a child... Uh, you do your judging in a, real, in a real bad way and you go according to this, just to the flow of the doctrine and, and uh, this type of a thing. So and the fact that uh, kids don't even know how, you know how a kid is, a kid fights for one second and then five seconds later they're best of friends again. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but uh, <clears throat> we could be that way one day enemy, one day friends, one day enemy, one day friends. And that's ridiculous. That's not how it should be. That's a childish thing. So that's what we did in Sunday school this morning. And then the, uh, the main service we talked about where Paul says we really aren't supposed to judge the brethren, though, because we have a judgment seat coming up. You've got your own time between you and the Lord. Don't worry about anybody else's. So if we don't want to worry about anybody else's in our judgment seat, why should we worry about anybody else's today unless you have some kind of a special relationship or you care for somebody or, like Paul says, you love them. And then you try to help them. That's Paul's whole purpose there. We saw that uh, we will be judged by Paul's gospel. So our judgment seat for us, as we will be accountable for ourselves as a person, which is our works, compared to the Gospels, they'll be accountable for every word, every idle word uh, in their lives. So there's still a difference there. Looked at some verses, I think we did anyway. Yeah, we did. Uh, looked at some verses that uh, dealt with our zealousness, our, our zeal, our desire to help somebody, our desire to show somebody that they don't look good because it's really embarrassing to them. If you, if, you, if you care for people like that, and, and, and be careful, that sort of a thing, then you're quickly account, uh, uh, accused of being judging, very judgmental, even though he didn't say anything. Lots of times uh, you show up with a comment about your Bible and Paul, and they think that you're judging their salvation. If you show up in a room doing something differently or dressed differently or that you don't go to something, they accuse you of judging them, and you did nothing of the kind. You just are taking care of yourself. And uh, we run across those verses, you know, the says there in Galatians that they zealously affect you, which is a dangerous thing, uh, and yet they would exclude us, or they don't want us to affect them. So there's a bunch of verses like that. So Paul is very clear about judgment. We need to grow in judgment, but it isn't against each other. It's against what's wrong in our personal, private lives. Then we looked at a couple of odd and ends, odds and ends verses, which we'll look at here tonight, just a couple more here. Um, uh, we looked at Acts chapter 17. This is on part three of the notes. 
on, on Acts chapter 17, 31, where it talks about uh, the Lord will be the judge, and, and uh, it's going to all be talked about uh, the risen Savior. So if, if the Christians believe that Jesus Christ rose again, why wouldn't they want to hear about Jesus, hear from Jesus Christ after he rose? You know, they, they, they take his teachings from before he died and rose, and they try to apply those teachings, and they totally ignore the ones that he, was, that he taught, the, uh, taught Paul uh, to teach everybody else to follow. We looked at Romans chapter 3, verse 4 to 9, for all men are liars. Uh, let God be true, every man a liar. And then it goes on to the much better explanation uh, beyond that, that uh, sure, we're all liars, so we have to have a book that is not a lie, that is a 100% piece of truth, so that we do talk to people scripturally, we're not lying. So what do people think about the Word of God today? They think it's a lie. They think it's made by man, so if man made it, it's not all quite there. So that'd be a good verse right there, Romans 3, 4 through 9, to show people, yeah, all men are liars, but uh, God didn't leave the book up to men to write. And that thing is inspired and uh, preserved, and it's perfect. doesn't mean that it's airless. It is airless, but it means that it's, uh, it's done. So let's go here to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and let's look at some odd things that has to do with judgment for tonight, part 3. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I first read this chapter years and years ago. Uh, it was an exciting verse. It was an exciting set of verses, because starting with verse 9, it talks about the fact here is what God has given to those people an understanding that the world doesn't have. It's a marvelous set of verses. By the time you get down to verse 16, you are told that you have the mind of Christ. Down to verse 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, that's quite, a pair, that's quite a series of verses in there. You would think by reading those verses from this point on, you don't need your Bible anymore because God has given you these things. He's given you that up in verse 9, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Well, we love him. We're trusted. We trust in him. So he said he gives us those things by his spirit, the deep things of God in verse 10. It says in verse 12, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Okay, now how do you explain that? That is the series of verses right there when somebody says, I'm a Christian, God tells me things. God gives me an understanding. What's the answer to that? The only answer you've got is the Bible. Since that which is perfect uh, has come, that thing just got negated right there. Now the Spirit of God will do that, and those verses right there, but it will do it through that Bible. It will not do that through us. And boy, right there, if you can, you're done talking with people if you have to get to this point, which is too bad. But uh, that's the way that is. So our judgment today, based on what the Spirit of God tells us, must come from the Bible based on 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 8 through 10. That's a quick thing. Look at chapter 5, verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother or be a, uh, be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such uh, an one know not to eat. For what, I ha what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. See, a lost person isn't our problem. So he says, do we not realize that what's going on within the brethren, that's a wrong situation? And if need be, he says they're uh, put away from yourselves, that wicked person. Who's that wicked person? That's a brother. That's what he's talking about there. So there's no, such, there's no such teaching where God tells us not to judge at all. He tells us that we need to judge. We need to judge righteously. We need to judge based on this book. Uh, we all know that we need to have grace, we need to have long-suffering, we need to have patience, we need to have mercy, just like he's had with us. But there does come a time where things have to take place. And uh, to the point, point where he even calls that person a brother, he calls that person a wicked person. And it isn't just one or two of the things. It's a railer. What's so bad about being a railer? Well, he's pretty heavy, hearty, hearty mouthy, hard on people, rails on people. Or a drunkard, just alcohol, he's drunk into different things. Gluttony, extortioner, they all fit in. Um, covetous, that's a tough one. We all, we all got, we got, you know, it's covetous, that's not that big a thing, or an idolater. And uh, I read a verse about that, but not, not tonight here. It kind of explains that a little bit. So yeah, we need to be doing, we need, need to be doing judgment even amongst ourselves. 
Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 5. There's a context which we'll skip here tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 5. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that should be able to judge between his brethren? This is an issue from a Christian to a Christian. We can't figure that stuff out? So judgment needs to take place there. Look at chapter 10. Look at chapter 10. God is not telling anybody ever not to judge. He's telling us not to judge each other uh, to other persons because we have our own judgment seat, but he still tells us to judge what's going on, and if you shouldn't participate, then you don't. If you shouldn't be around somebody, then you shouldn't. You're not judging them. You're judging the situation and, the, you know, that kind of a thing, and you, and you step aside. So God is never one to say, uh, judge not that you be not judged. He's talking to hypocrites there. Verse uh, 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15 from Paul. He says, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. So what are we supposed to do there? We're supposed to judge what Paul says. And we know exactly what Paul says. If we, if we know what he says, we look at it. Look at, verse, uh, look at uh, Corinthians uh, verse 11, chapter 11. So this is all stuff that took place before a King James Bible came along. A lot of people believe it's the Bible that came along, just the Bible in general. But we know back by looking at all those different Bible translations of the Matthews Bible, the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible, which, by the way, is still is a big seller right now. And it's so horribly Calvinistic and so hard to read and so hard to deal with it. It is just another one of those tricks to get people out of the King James Bible. But it says here, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Well, we're not going to be judged. It's that simple. Based on Paul's teachings, we're not going to be judged. Our works are going to be judged, but we're not going to be judged. So there must be something different about this verse. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Well, uh, we know that we don't receive any physical chastening. I don't believe we do. We don't have to fear his chastening. Except from where? Where is God going to chew you up and down with a statement that's going to give you a hard time if you're doing the Bible? And that, that we should not be condemned with the world. Well, we can't be condemned with the world, but we can be part of the world enough that our testimony stinks right along with the world's. So what are all these verses we looked at? These are all below, before the Bible, before the King James Bible, put it that way. Um, yeah, you go back to the first one we did, the Spirit of God teaches us those things through the Bible. You go back to the one about not to have company with. How do we know that? Uh, God will take care of the brethren within the Bible. We go back to uh, um, we should be able to judge the brethren as far as issues go. We should be able to solve an issue within the church with the Bible. We go back and he tells us to, to, to judge what Paul says. How do we know what Paul says? The Bible. We go back there and we see we're going to be chastened of the Lord. Only by how? By words. The Bible. Nothing else is going to come from within and this is what everybody's falling for. Now go to, uh, go to Colossians chapter 2. Now this is usually what takes place though, and, and uh, everybody's so concerned about us being so judgmental. I shouldn't be wearing this, and I shouldn't be going here, shouldn't be doing that. Give us for being judgmental. Yet uh, more and more people are throwing uh, Colossians 2.16 out here at us, and they say, let no man therefore judge you in meat. And that isn't whether you like hamburger or steak, it's in doctrine. Or in drink or in respect of unholy day, and you can go back to meat and drink, and you can even have people that judge us in meat and drink, or in respect of unholy day, or the new moon, or the Sabbath days. And there's a bunch of that taking place today. They're judging us for that. There's people right now that if you were to ask them, they say that we're, we've taken the mark of the beast because here we are on a Sunday. And that's, you know, that, that's crazy. And he says, let no man therefore judge you. He says, let them not judge you. So you need to stick up and say to somebody, hey, listen, you can't judge me over that thing. Paul takes care of that. So we, we tell people, yeah, the Ten Commandments are very important, but A, so are all the other commandments in the Bible, but we can't follow those. God nailed those to the cross, so we don't even have to worry about those. What about the things Paul taught? Paul taught things he called commandments. Do we have to obey all those commandments? We ought to, but we can't. So what about those big ten? You want to go to war over these ten commandments? You want to get involved in all these uprisings and and riots, and not riots yet, but uh, uh, gatherings and this big, big to-do about the fact that they're taking Ten Commandments out. So you're going to stick up for Ten Commandments when you know the truth of the Ten Commandments. There's only nine. So why are we going to fight for Ten Commandments when God only says nine? What does America do? Does it go back to the law? Does it go back to the Ten Commandments? Does it go back to all this, all this stuff? No, it goes to Paul. Uh, we don't worry about the Sabbath day being holy because it's not. Christ is God is not in this building. He is in us, and so wherever you go, there's your, there's your place. 
Yeah, we talk about quite a bit. Come to our church and worship, and that isn't, we worship here, but you worship on the way home if you want. You can worship anywhere you want, because everywhere you go, God's at. That's just, that's just, it's just too simple of stuff. So th- this judgment stuff is just way out of hand from, from wrongly dividing, and it becomes profane and vain babblings. Now let's go down to Matthew, let's go back to Matthew 6, 7 again. Go Matthew 7 again. Look at a couple more interesting verses regarding judging. And verse 3, and you've got to read these three verses really closely, as I've, as I've discovered here. And why beholdest thou the mote, which is the small little piece, the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? And that's true. There's, there's nothing wrong about saying that. I mean, here you are concerned about somebody else's little bitty thing in their life, and you've got a huge issue in your life. So I guess you, you, know, you could look to that thing. Eh, that makes good sense. Or verse 4, how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Now, how are you going to do that? How about verse 5, thou hypocrite, that's where he gets him, see, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then shall thou thou see clearly to cast out the mote of the other brother's eye. That's pretty good stuff, I mean, you know. But, but, the, but the problem there is, who are you to be worrying about somebody else's beam or molt or whatever in their eye? Look at verse 3 again. Why beholdest thou the mote? That's a little bitty piece, a little bitty speck thing that is in thy brother's eye. You're more worried about his petty little thing or his small little thing, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye. Then he says, how will you say to the brother? Let me pull out the mote of thine, own, of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye. And then God, that's where you come up with being a hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly and to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. Remember where Jesus says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, and everybody goes out there to do everything they can for their neighbor, and they forgot to love the right person first? Who's that? Thyself. You've got to get yourself taken care of before you worry about somebody else's a little moat or beam in their eye, whatever. And how, how do you take care of yourself first? What are you aware of that this other person needs to hear or whatever? Look at Galatians chapter 6. So are you aware of what Christ did for you? Are you aware of what he did to you? Could you, can you for yourself, can you, can you explain your salvation? What took place when you were saved? What are the things that Christ has done? What about sin? What about sinning? How does that whole issue be settled in your life? What about your salvation assurance? I mean, what about this King James Bible? What about rightly dividing? You got to, are you secure with this stuff? Because if you're secure with this stuff, you know what you start recognizing? You start recognizing uh, uh, motes in other people's eyes. And it's not that you're being snoopy. It's not that you're being out of place or out of whack. You can just start seeing some things. But he still says to take care of things in your own life. And, and my first question, just for me personally, is when you finally find uh, uh, the beam or even the moat that's in your eye, and you finally quit looking at everybody else and you're looking at yourself, and in uh, all issues that, that Paul talks about, uh, and, you, and you recognize something that's in you that you want to deal with, do you despise that? That's, that's a question I ask me. Uh, uh, the reason I want to do what I want to do over the next couple of years is because I despise what's going on in Christianity. I despise that. I despise what's going on in music. Um, I really despise what's going on in families, but it's not my business, and I've had my own things that I've created. So who am I to say anything? But I know what the modern Christianity has done to me and to my family. I know what, the, I know what modern music has done. Uh, I've taught kids. If I go back and teach them again, I'd want to do it properly, and uh, where are we headed? Because I really despise what, what's going on with the music. I, I'm getting to where if somebody's listening to music, even if it's good music, I'm beginning to despise that because they're, they're not thinking. That music is doing something. It's, and I'm, I don't let me go so far that, man, he just wants to throw music out the window totally. No, it's in the Bible. It's for God's glory and God's praise, and if you can think on it because it's clean stuff, go for it. But... I despise the fact that some people hide behind good music. Keep your music going all day. You never have to think about anything. You know? So 
if, if you're going to take care of yourself first, before you worry about somebody else's music, you better take care of yours. That kind of a thing. And my first comment was, uh, we need to despise what it is that was wrong in our lives. And then, do you have a victory? If you haven't got a victory, who are you to tell somebody else about what they need to do? So Jesus' teachings in the Gospels, he's got a good point there as far as who do you to worry about somebody else's. But look at Galatians chapter 6 here, verse 3. See what Paul does say along these lines here. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Then he says in verse 4, But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. I look at that verse, especially verse 4, and I see some people that ministers, pastors, myself, can be very easily included in this thing, or a father or a mother or whatever. We are, we are so concerned about somebody else that we haven't proven our own work, ourselves. It's so easy to be critical of somebody else's music or their attire or where they go or what they do. By the way, how are you doing? And if you got it nailed down and, and it's not a problem, see, alcohol's not a problem for me. Never had a problem with alcohol. So I can't even identify with, with the problem that, that people have with alcohol. I don't, it doesn't, I don't despise it. I know what it's doing to the world and, and that type of a thing. And, but uh, I've got things in my life that I despise because it's done me over the years. And if you got that thing nailed down, then that's a joyful thing for you and you alone. And so then it's time to look at somebody else if the situation works that out. Not in a judgmental way, though, but just to be a help. Every man shall bear his own burden. So you take care of yourself first before you deal with somebody else. Love thy neighbor as thyself. So you've got to start with yourself before you can go for that neighbor to help them out. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. I know too many people that spend their times helping other people and never deal with themselves instead. And lots of, lots of cases, the other person will not allow you to help them because you haven't even helped yourself. 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 15. Meditate upon these things. Well, what's that? We go back through uh, 14 and 13 and 12, 11, let no man despise their youth, etc., etc. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. And thy profiting may appear to all. So that's good. If we, if we are serious about Paul, it should change our lives somewhere along the line. Visual, physical differences in our lives. The joy of peace uh, doesn't mean we're going to be prosper prosperous. It doesn't mean anything like that. It just means that we're going to handle things better and, and uh, that manner of life. And he says that thy profiting, you'll profit from verse 12, 13, and 14. You'll be profiting in there especially the young people, because that's what he's talking about. Be an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity. Well, sure, charity's there, but so is conversation, so is word, so is in spirit, so is in faith, so is in purity. We can't just pick one out and make a big thing about it. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation. That's preaching, and to doctrine, that's Bible study. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given thee by prophecy. Now there he's talking to Timothy, as he is for all these things, and Timothy received that gift by laying on of the hands. Well, how does that fit in before the book? Paul laid his hands on Timothy and transferred something over to Timothy. Be, be, beats me how God does stuff like that, but he doesn't do that anymore. So we pull out something like that, we bring a couple of guys up here, and the deacons who don't know the answer to most of the questions, they ask the, the new missionary, right? And... Uh, and they lay their hands on him, and they pray over him, and, they, and they, what are they transferring to this guy? Nothing. Zero zilch. But they do it because that's what Paul did to Timothy, but that's before the book. But besides that, he does say to meditate upon these things, and thy profiting may appear to all. I mean, you're going to grow. You're going to grow. You're going to change. And that's what, now look at verse 16. Take heed unto thyself. You know, that's okay to take heed unto thyself. And unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself, that's a good thing, that's you got to start with thyself, and them that hear thee. What if you don't think you're getting anywhere? doesn't matter. You take care of yourself spiritually, doctrinally, uh, between you and the living God, and scripturally, and rightly dividing this, and rightly dividing that, and making sure you're doing the things you ought to be. Somebody's going to notice. 
Now, the ones that notice it will probably get mad at you, but not everybody. Not everybody. They're going to notice something later on. And it says, and them that hear thee. So, you just got to stand strong. Look at Philippians chapter 1. Here's that verse again. We're going to take care of ourselves. We're going to love thy neighbor as thyself. As he's talking about here, for uh, involved judging other people and helping. We don't judge other people. We judge the things to help them with. And we go back to verse 9 and 10, that this, this knowledge and judgment should grow. And it's the love. It should grow. That ye may approve things that are excellent. We're, we're supposed to be able to do that. So we talked about that this morning. And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. There's that verse. I always go to this verse when it comes to showing people that you've changed. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, For they themselves show of us of what manner of entering in we had unto you. So Paul and his teachings and his people uh, entered in uh, to these people in Macedonia and Achaia, and their lives changed because they serve the living and true God now. That's why. So, so people will see, will see things. So you, but you've got to take care of yourself first before you start dealing with somebody else. Then in 2 Timothy chapter 2, let's say you've got an opportunity to help somebody else. Not in a judgmental fashion, but you know there's a need there, and you, and you do step up to the plate, and you do try to help. Because from brother to brother, we ought to be able to help each other. And we go right to this classic set of verses in verse 24, chapter 2. It says that we're not to strive... Uh, we're to be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure. And there's that whole thing. What's it about? It's about getting somebody out of a snare. That's what it's all about. But we also recognize in verse 26 that we can't do it for them. They have to do it themselves. But you can guide them. You can show them. Uh, uh, and, and you go through this whole series. We did this a long time ago. You pictured uh, an animal in a trap, and if that animal's been in the trap long enough, you leave the door open, he still won't leave. I left the front gate of this uh, yard over here open the last couple days uh, off and on and come back, and the dog's still here. He knows he can't go outside of that gate. I never, I never whacked him for going outside the gate or anything like that. There's not a buzz across there that nails his little, his little hide and all that kind of stuff. He just has been so long inside that yard, he doesn't think he can go out that yard. Either that or he's scared to death of the cats that he's barked at because he knows they all hate him. And he's barked at all these cats. One of these days I'm going to give that dog a cat to play with. And he's going to realize he doesn't want to ever leave that gate to mess with the cat. First Thessalonians chapter 3. So we, we do care for other people. There is judging that takes place when something is wrong. You've got to make a judgment call that if you want your kids to go over somebody's house, you've got to make a judgment call. Should they or should they not? You take them to a store. Should you or should you not go into that store? Do you want them to go down aisle nine or do you want to skip aisle nine? You make judgment calls all the time. Where do you draw the line when you're making those kind of calls? Uh, first, second, first Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. First of all, these guys better have nothing lacking in their faith. Well, they don't. This is Paul and his little bunch. So now they want to go out there and they want to show somebody that we might see your face. You know, it isn't because their face is so pretty. He says, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face is because they want to be with you. Okay? I mean, nobody has an intense desire to see this face. I mean, if, you, if any of you ever come to this church because you want to see this face, then I'll give you a picture and you can stay home if that's all it is you're here for. But if you're here to see my face because I'm going to show you something that God has shown me in the Bible this week, then that's okay. And he says right there, might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Is that judgmental? Is that being judgmental? It's not being judgmental. That's because you've got a grip on some things in your life and you want to try to help somebody else give some strength to their faith. That's what that is. If they don't want it, then they don't want it. But it isn't because you're being judgmental. It's it's so hard anymore to say anything, even from a pulpit pastoral standpoint. It's so hard to say anything anymore because who wants their faith strengthened? Who's willing to admit that we're lacking something in our faith so our preacher, who isn't perfect, picks up this Bible and says some things out of that Bible? You know it's coming from Paul. You know it's safe. 
but you, but you just don't want that. And too many times I've been accused of being judgmental. Ah, okay, fine. I, I'm being judgmental. But uh, you see the damage that takes place. You know, you're, you're trying to deal with it. Anyway, leave that alone. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Look at Colossians chapter 2. People, can endure, people will not endure sound doctrine in these days. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's a bum thing to learn about, but that is true. You know what's right. You've read that Bible enough times. You've read Paul's things enough times. You've read Timothy and Titus. Sometimes you slip some stuff on or go some places or think some things or do something. You know it's wrong. You don't, have anybody need, you don't need anybody to tell you that that's a wrong thing. Do you get mad at your Bible because it's too judgmental? Well, yeah, some people don't like to read their Bible because it, it, it rebukes them. It chastises them. It tells them again that what they're doing is wrong, no matter what the temperature is. You shouldn't be like that. So that's the way we are. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, here it is again, verse 1. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you. Paul had this huge conflict for these people. And for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Now, we don't see Paul's face in the flesh today because his face is not in any flesh anywhere. But don't you have a great conflict for somebody to get a hold of this Paul stuff? Sure you do. You have a great conflict for that. And they haven't ever heard it before. I mean, uh, these men, Hugh and, and uh, Sam and all these guys that are out there, they're trying to talk to people about a concept that they've never heard before. They've never read Paul. They've never had Paul ever preach to them. That's pretty tough stuff. I'm thinking if I get a chance to talk to somebody here in the next couple days about Paul, you know what I really want to do? I just want to sit down and start with Romans and start at the beginning and read to Philemon. And take about two days to do that, a little preaching and this, that. Well, there's my sermon series right there. I'll just start with Romans, and you guys can come and go as you want, dinner time, lunch time, breakfast, and all that. Not in that order, of course. And, and just put one whole sermon, one whole read of those books. And then when you get done, if the guy has listened at all, and then you just look over at him and go, do you see it? Because there it is. I mean, there it is. You don't have to. I don't understand why we have to make such a, why do, we need pres, why do we need three PowerPoint presentations? Why do we need to hang out all these great important verses when it says when you get right into that thing that Stephen was killed, Christ goes to Paul, he's the apostle. He's just reading through the Bible in the order that the Bible's in, right? And this is what he teaches to Paul. And you get into Ephesians. Nobody else has heard this stuff, the mystery of Christ. Why is that so hard to get? And uh, he says in Corinthians, to follow me as I follow Christ. He's always talking about the risen Savior. Why is this? I don't understand why this is so hard. But I guess we didn't see it for a long time. Why didn't we see it for a long time? Because we were being taught. We weren't reading as much. And I'll save that in my testimony someday of why that came about. But anyway. So why can't people just see Paul and get it? that their hearts might be comforted. Verse 2. You want somebody's heart to be comforted in the mess they're living? You know what they need? I know they need Jesus. Yeah, they need Jesus. They need the risen Jesus. I know they need the risen Jesus. They need the risen Savior, the risen Christ. Uh, I know they need a King James Bible. But you know what they really need? They really need Paul. How many people are uncomforted and they still have a King James Bible? Bible believing church, the whole thing. Uh, being knit together in love and into all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Well, excuse me, if, the, if all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid in, in God and the Father and of Christ, which is a risen Savior, don't you think you'd be looking for something like that? For though I, and, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words, which is what's going on everywhere, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And then he, then he says this horrible word, this dangerous, dirty word to Christians. As ye have therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. And, and, and there you go. How do you walk with what Paul teaches, the risen Christ? Well, that's just, there you go. So that's what people need. Now let's, let's go back to Matthew 7 and kind of wrap this up a little bit. Christ is, 
uh, Jesus is teaching about judging, and we just looked at what Paul said this morning and this evening about uh, other people and judging their situation, not judging the people, but trying to help others in their situation. In order to help somebody else, you have to make a judgment call. You know, what are they doing? Is it wrong? Do they need help? If not, then, then get out of the way. But he says something really hard. I think it's really hard. In verse 6, if you've paid attention up to this point here and understand some of that stuff, the moat in somebody else's eye, take care of yourself first and all that sort of a thing. Then he says in verse 6, and you got a paragraph mark in there, some of your Bibles, and it's almost like there's a different thought here, but you know, really there isn't. Uh, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Now, look at Matthew chapter 10. We know that, uh, doctrinally, that Jesus called uh, the Gentiles dogs. And it mentions in Romans chapter 10, at the end of that chapter, that the Gentiles are looked upon not even as a people. So Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, we see that uh, Jesus uh, uh, sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Do you see this? I mean, people, do you not see this out there somewhere on this web world that Jesus told his disciples not to go to the Gentiles? Okay, so if he told his people, his, his leaders, his guys, don't go to the Gentiles then, why would Jesus now say, let's go to the Gentiles? I, I just, you know, it's one of those things. It's like somebody keeps playing an F sharp and it's written F natural, and 10 years later they're still playing an F natural, an F sharp instead of an F natural. After a while you're thinking, is there some reason you can't just put an F finger in that little sharp key there? I mean, why can't you do that? Are you not, are you, what's going on here? So I don't understand why when somebody reads that he told his people not to go to the Gentiles with these teachings, then what are we doing going to the Gentiles with these teachings today? That's just a sidelight question. He says in Matthew 15, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of Israel. That's just what he says. So when he says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, dogs being the Gentiles, he wouldn't go to them. And you know some of the stories that are in there. Now, we also know that eventually he did. The Jews were supposed to take those teachings out to this world and then finally do that. That's at the end of the, uh, I was going to say career, but Jesus didn't have a career. You know, that was what he was doing down here reading through your Acts, Acts, Acts chapter 1 through 8, and you see that the thing disappeared and kind of died off with the death of Stephen. Why, why today do they still take that stuff, even to the lost world, is what they're doing. When we take a King James Bible, rightly divided, Paul's teachings, you know what that is? That is that which is holy. That's ho the whole Bible is holy. But as far as what goes to the people, that the Spirit of God will work on that person, has to come from Paul's writings. Now, look what happens, what he says back in those days. What would happen if these guys would take something holy to the dogs or cast their pearls, the, the beautiful stuff that's in what God has said, before swine? They're gonna, they, they trample it under their feet, it says. It says, uh, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. That's not just trampling it. They're turning again and getting back at you is what they're doing. And, and it puzzles me. People would rather... People would rather live in their shipwrecked life. They'd rather live in this, in this fleshy, fun, they're miserable on the inside world, uh, fleshly, lustful satisfactions for now, sin for a season kind of a thing, and start to try, instead of trying to get things right. They'd rather live in that snare. They'd rather, that dog would rather live inside this yard than go out that gate, which is freedom for that dog. Why is that? Look at, look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, the hard part's coming up here. It's hard for me to say because I know what some people think. I think about certain people, and I don't want that to fire that thought up again, but, but we have to say something here. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. So, Jesus basically tells us, listen, you're going to take this holy stuff, this stuff from Paul, and you're going to take it out to a bunch of dogs and, and a bunch of swine. And they're going to trample on it, they're going to come back, and they're going to kick you. That's, that's what's going on. And we, we take it out to these people, and they're coming up with laws against it. It just happens to be, the, I do believe the reason laws are coming up against it, because people have gone out with a false gospel. They've gone out with a God that will 
uh, chastise them and judge them and hurt them because they're not doing right. And if you're a Christian, uh, God will get you if you're still not doing right. And that's not the truth. And as a result of these people saying God hates fags, as a result of these Baptist King James only people preaching that uh, that guy was killed in a war because America's going queer and they make big fusses like that, there's no wonder we're having laws put on us like we're having put on us. There's no wonder that people are making a big stink in a, in a neighborhood about a Bible study if there's a lot of ruckus going on and a lot of car parking, a lot of problems and banging in other people's cars and it disturbs the neighbor. I, I can understand that kind of stuff. It's kind of too bad they don't do that for the other parties that are going on. Uh, the party across the street here has been really relatively quiet today. And we have, listen, we in our earlier days have gone to restaurants I don't know how the other people, as I think back at this, I don't know how the other people in that restaurant were able to talk to themselves. We were so loud. Remember those years? I remember those years, and uh, I'm embarrassed over a lot of things. We'd leave some of those restaurants with more food on the floor than they had in their kitchen. I remember that. He says here, so don't take that stuff out to the dogs because they're not interested. And Demas, he went off to, he loved the present world. He loved the way things are, so he left. Now, look at Proverbs chapter 11. Now, sure, there are a lot of loud women out there, a lot of loud parties going on. There's a lot of men that are rude and crude and that type of a thing, a lot of teenagers that are rowdy and mouthy. And are we that way amongst Christianity? Well, he says, Not to take that which is holy unto the dogs. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Now, here we go. I'm in trouble for this. I might as well warn you now. Proverbs 11, verse 22. You know the verse. As a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman with, which is without discretion. Okay? Now, look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. Quickly, to get me out of the mess you're, you're putting me in here. 2 Peter 2, it's a tribulation verse, no, no doubt. So we know we're getting into some really rough times. We're not going to be here for the tribulation, but we're getting pretty close, and you know, whatever. No point in worrying about it. Get a job, get a career, get an interest, get something going. Don't sit around and wait for the rapture kind of stuff. Uh, get going, just base it on Paul's teachings. 2 Peter 2.22 says this, But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again. And I know we've all watched that, and that is pretty gross. I have to admit, that's pretty gross, you know? And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. We see here in verse 6, back to Matthew 7, verse 6, he's telling us that it's really going to be hard to take Paul, King James Bible, rightly divided, showing Paul, risen Savior, the Bible being that which is perfect has come, negates all the other stuff that's done in part, and that, that rightly divided Bible will show you how to please the living God. It's hard to take that to a world with a bunch of dogs and swine. And the dogs, look at that, see, and the heater goes off just when I have to say this too. <laughs> the, the, this country is full of dogs and swine. It's full of men who are going back to their old days, their old vomit, the, the, and the ladies, uh, the swine, the, the jewel in the, in the snout. A fair woman without discretion. What do we have out there? Women without discretion. What do we have out there? Men going doing the worldly thing. That's what's happening. And we're supposed to take them, Paul. You see, Paul just isn't a, a good chapter out of a Bible. It's holy. That is the sacred scriptures that we're trying to tell a bunch of dogs and pigs out there. Now, is that judgmental? It's not judgmental. Look who said this. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine. Okay, it, you're going to go out there and you're going to cast this stuff, this Paul stuff, this Titus and Timothy type of stuff, especially Titus, to, to, to ladies who have no discretion. And they've turned, after, they've turned aside after Satan. Do we wonder why we get the reaction we get? Let's show some of this stuff about being a man that Paul teaches about being a grown-up man and no longer childish as a man and, and the preaching and the teaching he needs to have for his wife and for his daughter and for his children and, and to do right for his family. And he's a dog. He's gone back to the old ways. He's returned to the vomit. And we're going to show this to these people? 
Well, uh, Jesus, Jesus says, if you do that, they're going to trample, trample them under your feet. And they're going to go back and get you. Should we, should we not do it then? No, because we turn to the risen Savior. The risen Savior says, yes, that's what you need to do. And he says that in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Yes, we know that the world is full of dogs and, and swine. Us men, weren't we ever dogs? Aren't we supposed to be girls? Sure, we've been dogs before. Have we gone back to the, have we vomited up stuff and gone back to it? Sure we have, lots of ways. Ladies, you ever been without discretion? Sure you have. If you don't know when, give me a call. We've, we've been there. So we understand what Jesus says. It is true. It is very true. Trying to teach a lady, try to teach a man today what Paul says to men and to women. But he does say in 2 Timothy chapter 4, preach the word, verse 2, that's what he says to do. He doesn't tell us not to. He tells us to do so. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Keep that doctrine going. And he says, listen, there's going to come a time they won't, they won't hear it. Watch uh, thou in all things endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. You've got to say what you've got to say. Make full proof of thy ministry. And then Paul says he's done. He's ready to be offered. And I hope I'm not ready to be offered. I hope you're not ready to be offered yet. Um, the whole judging thing is, is not what people make it out to be. The devil's managed to get people to think that we shouldn't judge at all. And that's not true. We're just not supposed to judge the brethren. But things that are taking place need to be judged. And as far as the world that's out there, whether it be saved or lost, you take care of yourself first, and then you love them as thyself. And you want them to have what you have. And that's... That's just the way it is. And uh, things need to be said today. We just have to remember we're saying them to pigs and or swine and dogs. That sounds pretty, pretty harsh, but those are Jesus' words. And uh, that, that, so be it. That's, that's, what, uh, that's how wrong we are with the Sermon on the Mount going to the judging. Not yet. They've actually, they've actually taken his command in chapter 7, verse 1, and even tweak that thing. Then they take what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, and they tweak that thing. People don't want to be judged. But they don't even want the goodness and the long-suffering and patience of God either. And that's too bad. So yes, we have to make our judgment. We have to do so. If we don't, I believe we'll lose our kids. We could lose the church. Of course, like we say, we talk about uh, turn back and rend you, right? Doesn't it say turn and rend you? They're just coming back to get us. They're coming up with laws. They're shutting down the churches. Uh, if they can't shut down the churches, they'll take it without, make it too expensive to have one. They can't get rid of guns. They'll get rid of the ammo. If they can't get rid of the ammo, they'll make a shortage. You can't afford to buy bullets for your, bullets for your guns anymore. They'll, they'll get it done. They'll get it done. But uh, uh, judging is supposed to take place, no doubt.